Let's talk about some ways to improve the performance of our neural networks. Uh, so let's talk about first invariances. Uh, very often we want neural networks to be, to be invariant to certain transformations of images, like, like maybe you want to be able to uh, detect a dog in the image no matter where the dog is, or if you want to rotate the dog a little bit, you still want the network to be able to detect it. Anyway, so there's two, uh, at least two ways to build invariances into a neural network. The first is to tell the neural network what you want it to be invariant to by constraining it. However, it is not easy to put constraints into a neural network. They are really not amenable to that sort of thing. So <laughs> plan number two is to change the data. Change the data so that we can incorporate invariances directly into the data set and hope that the neural network will learn the invariance. So here's a picture here that I took of um, a dragon a couple years ago. And what I can do to my data set is include uh, art new artificial data, like I can flip horizontal flip my dragon because it's still a dragon when I flip it horizontally. I can include slight rotations of the dragon. I can resize the dragon. I can crop bits of the dragon out. I can change the contrast or the brightness or the distortion because I really would like my neural network to be able to identify the dragon um, despite changes in brightness or distortion or all of these other things. Now, certain types of invariances are important to keep around um, and certain ones uh, we have to be careful of because, you know, for a dragon, if you flip it certain ways, it's still a dragon. But if you take a handwritten number nine and you flip it certain ways, it is no longer a number nine. <laughs> so be careful of how you, uh, how you do data augmentation. You just want to make sure that you record invariances you actually want to, you know, you actually want the network to be invariant to. All right, residual nets. Um, residual nets is a really powerful tool. It's very, very simple. So in standard neural networks, you take your input x and you send it through the network and you get h of x and you hope that h of x predicts the, uh, the, uh, the label y. Um, and so here you hope to fit a model called h of x. But uh, resi in residual nets, that's not exactly what they do. They actually um, try to they do something different. They try to model just the residual of x. Okay, so they actually keep an extra copy of x around and it's always available as a feature later on. And so now you're modeling f of x, which is the residual of, of x, okay? And you hope that f of x plus x is a good model for the label y. Okay, so you're now learning a residual of identity. And so you'd think, well, wh why, would keeping this, why would keeping this extra information about x be valuable? Well, it turns out it's kind of helpful for the vanishing gradient problem because by adding x, when you take the derivative of the error with respect to x, um, that, that derivative actually increases by one because you've added an extra x in it, right? You take derivative of h of x with respect to x, you get an extra one. So you have less vanishing derivatives. Um, now this trick apparently allowed neural networks to go much deeper than before. People were reporting that before they could only get to about 10 layers and now they could get to a thousand layers and a thousand layer network. I can't even imagine. <laughs> and so this is uh, an example of a, re a residual network where it's showing the residual um, connections there in the network. Dropout is another technique that um, is useful for training neural networks, which forces signal to be carried throughout the entire network. So, you know, if you train the network, it, it could be possible that only certain nodes in the network would actually be used and the rest of them just somehow didn't come into contact with gradients during training, right? And so uh, Dropout tries to prevent that from happening. Now what Dropout does is um, in each forward pass of the network for each neuron with some probability P, you set all of its output weights to zero. So you say with some probability, you neuron, I'm going to ignore you. Okay, so it's, it's systematically ignoring neurons throughout the process of training. And I know it sounds strange, but that's what it's doing. Because when, you, when it does this, it forces the network to rely on the other neurons. Okay, so usually the, the value of P is 
is 0.5. So half the time you ignore each neuron. It's like selectively ignoring the neurons so that the other neurons will be forced to compensate for the neurons you're ignoring. Okay, so this image at the bottom is just showing that uh, a bunch of these neurons with, with probability uh, 0.5 are out this round. <laughs> okay, so it, it, you can think about this is as if we were training exponentially many submodels because, you know, if you think about the number of subsets of neurons, well, that's exponential in this number of neurons. And, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of training all of these submodels simultaneously. Uh, so this, in some ways, it's a, a, in some ways, it's similar to bagging, which is you know bootstrap aggregating, where you're kind of doing a combination of many different submodels, and this is this is the same thing. You're creating many different submodels, and we can also say that it creates a, a redundant encoding because this because the information is encoding is encoded redundantly throughout the network, since you're systematically ignoring neurons, um, and so you have to get that information. From, from other sources in the network. So the network, the information has to be encoded redundantly. So here's an example where we're trying to um, judge whether, uh, whether, it's some, whether an image is a clown or whether somebody is a clown. <laughs> and so um, we have all of these features that are actually quite useful for determining whether someone is a clown. And so just uh, for right now, I'm just going to ignore the information about whether they juggle and the information whether the person's dressed in bright colors and just look at the other information and uh, create a submodel from, from that. Transfer learning is another trick to help us um, with, with neural networks because if you don't have enough data for your the particular problem you're working on, you can actually use a pre-trained network from another problem to help you with your problem. Okay, so this is um, using information about the solution to one problem to help solve another. So you could use the early layers from a pre-trained model in another network and retrain only the weights from the last few, few layers. Now I have uh, the VGG paper here because VGG is a common network where people use the first few layers of VGG and then they train the last few layers for their specialized problem that they're actually interested in. Okay, so neural networks, training them, it's a big bag of tricks. Dropout, batch normalization, data augmentation, residual networks, uh, choosing different activation functions, doing different initialization, transfer learning, it goes on. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really quite a large, a large bag of, of tricks to get these things to work well. Um, but like I said, uh, if, you, if you get them right, it works really well. Now there are other ways to improve neural networks than what I've just told you. For example, you can really uh, make a lot of effort in changing your data set. Fine grain labels is one example. So let's say I'm trying to train a neural network to detect a fence. You know, is there a fence in this picture? Well, there, there, you could have many images in your database, each one labeled as to whether there's a fence in the picture. But if the neural network doesn't know where the fence is, it has to use a huge amount of data to try to identify um, what's a fence from the other things in the image. If you simply provided fine-grained labels, if you simply told the network, oh, here's where the fences are, this is what a fence is, then it could learn much more efficiently. So there's a trade-off between like having a, a smaller amount of high-quality labels, because obviously you're not going to be able to do fine-grained labels for huge numbers of images, um, versus having kind of lower-quality labels for more images, right? And so what's the trade-off between these two, right? How many low-quality images with labels do you need to substitute for high-quality fine-grained labels? And that's uh, actually a question that's up for debate. It's a good question um, and it, it, you know, it's important. Yeah, and another thing you can do to improve neural networks is to understand your model so that you actually know what's wrong with it, to try to make your model less of a black box and more understandable. And um, I, I have um, many things to say about this topic, uh, but I'll save those for another video. Thanks.